say is Danik Fulham for seconds out. Eddie, we've just had the final weigh-in for Jorge Hilares versus Jack Cattrall. Both men on weight. You said yesterday for fighters like Jack, it's important that they go out and deliver a statement performance and give you something to go out and sell them off. For Jack, does that have to be a stoppage over this version of Jorge Linares? Well, not I mean, talk about this version. I think it looks unbelievable. I mean, I know he's not the fighter that he once was, but Ismail Salas, he's pumped. He's shouting in his ear. Robert Diaz is saying to me, trust me, we'll be back. And you have to think that he's going to give everything tomorrow night. I think it's a bit harsh to say you must stop him, but I think you must win well. And if you can stop him and, and do it in sensational fashion, it just makes my job easier. You know, if you go out and you don't perform and get to eight, nine rounds and people are a little bit unengaged, it's just harder to go back to the broadcaster and say, what about this guy against this guy, you know? So he's got the platform, he's got the opportunity, go and do it. And as has Peter McGraw as has Shabazz Massoud, as has all these guys that come with a hype. But the ones that deliver, when, when you've got a load of hype behind you and you do deliver, it's, it's really easy for us to do our job. We've seen Jorge break hearts from British shores a few times. That said, Jack is expected to come through on Saturday night. Now, you said, should he do so, uh, the winner of Regis Progre versus Devin Haney or the Josh Taylor fight makes sense. But I w watched an interview with you with an American channel and you said you would like the winner of Haney Progre to go on with Ryan Garcia. Is there danger that Jack will see that and think, sort of, you know, I'm feeling a bit disheartened here. I'm sort of second yeah, fiddle. Probably. I mean, a lot, you know, as a promoter, a lot sort of depends on where you are at the time. You know, you're um, you're sitting at the Haney Progre presser. Everyone's asking you about Ryan Garcia. And I'm saying, of course, I would love to make Ryan Garcia. I mean, you also have to know who I work for, which is the broadcaster and the fighters. And the broadcaster, if you were asking honestly what fight they would prefer right now, Ryan Garcia v. Devin Haney or Jack Cattrall against Devin Haney, it's a massive fight in America. But it's also Haney Cattrall is also a big fight as well. And, you know, doing a deal with Golden Boy and Ryan Garcia... Is, is not a given. And with a good performance, Jack can put his name in that hat. For me, if he performs well tomorrow night, that's the pressure on me is to make him be the winner of that fight or him against Josh Taylor. We know that's going to sell. We know it's got bad blood. It's got great narrative. But really, it comes down to tomorrow night. I spoke to Kevin Adjarko at the No Limits Boxing Club and he's obviously a stable mate of Josh Taylor and he said that uh, Josh will be moving up to welterweight, yeah. you know, regardless. Have there been any conversations with Jack? I know he's not going to be looking past Linares, but would he be happy to go up to 147 yeah, well, pounds? It wouldn't be at 147 from our side. It would have to be at catch weight. And, and that was, you know, all my conversations with Carl Moretti at top rank was it would be catch weight, whether that's 143 or 144. You know, there's no value. Jack's not a welterweight. We love the fight, but we're also not going to go up a weight class just because it suits Josh Taylor. If he wants to be a welterweight, then we can't make the fight. But if he wants to fight a big fight at a catch weight, you know, I'm sure three or four pounds would make a big difference to him. Um, but it's up to him. You know, he's his own man. And um, we've got to just take care of business tomorrow night. And then at about 11 o'clock, I'll be able to tell you what I think in terms of the likelihood of making either of those fights. Moving away from Saturday night, uh, Chris McKenna has provided an update on the Conor Ben case. He stated uh, the hearing is unlikely to be in January, until January, mm -hmm. and uh, there's going to be a meeting about who's actually going to hear the hearing. So does that sort of rule out any chance of Chris Eubank Jr. versus Conor Ben taking place in the UK up until maybe February, March? Not really. I think it actually encourages it. I mean, at the end of the day, he's not suspended. We believe legally um, he has the right to fight in the UK, and, and the board shouldn't not allow that because of him winning that case and not being suspended. So we are talking to the board for some clarity. We don't want to, you know, pursue another legal position on that or injunction and stuff like that. We just want to say to the board, look, if we apply for permission to box, he is not suspended. The hearing is likely to take place in January or February or whenever it is. We're not waiting till February to hear a case that we've already won. Obviously, we'll go through that procedure when the time comes. But in the meantime... We're going to make the Eubank fight. We want to make that fight in the UK. If we can't, we'll have to go internationally. But, you know, I'm, I'm saying to the board, we have an opportunity to do that fight. And we believe that legally we should be allowed to. If we can't, we have to consider our position. But our preference, as I've always stated, would be to do that fight in England. If you do decide that we're going in December, January, and we are going in the UK, but the board decided to block it, would you consider using the PBA to sanction the fight? Um... It's, you know, I think the British Boxing Board of Control do a great job. I think it is always our preference and intention to stay with the British Boxing Board of Control, to continue to help them grow as an organisation. Um, don't forget there are two fighters 
in this fight. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be, you know, we can also receive an offer to do that fight or Conor Ben can receive an offer. So we'll have to see, but we don't have any intention of staging that fight with another um, governing body in the UK. I feel that all fights, professional fights that take place in the UK should be with the British Boxing Board of Control. However, I do think they need to consider this, um, the position, their position, the actual legal position here and consider this fight. And then we'll go from there. There have been reports that uh, Tommy Fury, KSI, has done upwards of a million pay-per-view buys now. Joshua Fury aside, I think Eubank Ben is probably the biggest commercial fight in this country. Do you think that could rival those sort of numbers if it does get made? Yeah, I mean, you're talking global on those numbers, so, but still a huge success in the UK. Um, for me, Ben Eubank does a million buys. And that's a bit of a rarity, to be honest with you, in boxing these days. Like, you've seen, if you look at Sky... You know, they used to do, what, six pay-per-views a year. They're now doing none or one a year. There aren't many big fights out there away from Joshua, Fury, you know, and then Conor Ben, Chris Eubank. You know, they're the, the big pay-per-view stars at the moment. Um, and that's, you know, we need to make big fights in this country. I'm not just saying, oh, let's just let the fight happen anyway. But when, they're, when you've won a case and there's a strong legal position to suggest the fight should be allowed to take place... You know, I'd like to see it and I'd like to see it in this country rather than to continue having to take big fights abroad. Moving away, uh, it's read the Anthony Joshua men's health piece. Uh, really interesting read. Um, I don't want to say concerning sort of points raised, but some deep topics covered. He said, talked about bottling up emotions and he mentioned he was paying sort of £2,000 to go into this dark room for three or four days for like his mental health. And obviously it's been a rough couple of years for AJ. Has there ever been any stage you've been sort of, not just as his promoter, but as a friend, sort of concerned for his mental well-being? No, I mean, I've had lots of conversations with him and I think he's, you know, I don't think people recognise what he's been through as, a, as an individual, a normal bloke from an estate in Watford that gets thrown into a fishbowl where the whole world will have an opinion on you, where you can't leave your own house without a million photographers and people trying to stick microphones in your face and you know even the public wanting his time and, and selfies. And because of who he is, he will always give it. You will never see AJ come out of anywhere and go, you know, if there was... 50 kids outside a restaurant. He would talk to every one of them. He would sign, and, and it's like, he felt that, I think the pressure was this responsibility to act in a certain way. And even when he did, it wasn't good enough. And then he lost to Andy Ruiz and everyone just wrote him off and said he was useless. Like, but no one really cares. That's the reality. And what we saw in Saudi Arabia was an implosion of that bottled up pressure, which you talked about. Um, I think he's been very honest, particularly in that interview and in general. And I think it's great for people to realise that even people like AJ, you know, this man mountain of a man, can struggle. And I think he has struggled mentally. And I think he's in a good place now. Um, but I think he's also the guy that's always searching for improvements. So it's not so much of, I have mental health issues. It's how can I improve my mental health? Do you know what I mean? And I think by doing these different experiments. And that's what he's like, not just across that side, but every physical aspect of his training camp. You'll see him do, he's on Amazon, he's ordering this, and he's, because he's always trying to get the edge. So I think it's really difficult. And I think the perception, the public perception is always, oh, AJ, as he's struggling, he's got loads of money. So what? You know, oh, he's like, look at him. He's unbelievable. He's six foot six. He looks, he's like built like an Adonis. Doesn't matter. Sometimes what's going on up here is very different. And, He's definitely had his struggles, but boxing is definitely something that's kept him in a good place. And I feel like now, that's why, why I say, like, he doesn't need to fight and certainly doesn't need to take a small fight, but he, he, he's willing to take a small fight because he's really enjoying his boxing and he feels like he's getting momentum. He still feels like he's improving, but he still wants the big fights. So, um, you know, from my side... We always just want him to be happy. And I think he's finding his happiness through boxing at the moment. To bring it back to boxing uh, for Joshua, are you really considering Manuel Char as an opponent for him? Not overly. I mean, he's looking for an opponent. He's got the WBA regular title, which, you know, we certainly wouldn't be saying Joshua's a three-time world heavyweight champion. Definitely not. Um, but at the same time, if he's going to fight someone in December, I'm not saying it would be Char, but it could be Caballero. It could, could be Hergovic or Wilding out of this situation, see what happens. Um, it's, you know, it's not going to be Deontay Wilder. 
and it's not going to be Andy Ruiz, and it probably wouldn't be Zhang. So you have to look at that top 15. So, um, you know, honestly, we haven't really, we're more on the date than the opponent. Like he wants to fight in December because in his head, he says, I wanted to fight three times in the year. And I said, yeah, but you fought in April. He said, no, I want to fight three times in 2023. So he would love to get out in December and we'll have to keep one eye on the 23rd because we just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, opponent notwithstanding, how likely would you say it is that he is back out in December? 50-50. But if not December, 100% January. Obviously, the Wilder fight's been sort of talked about all year. Seems to be on the back burner for now. Just a word on Wilder. Obviously, he's boxed one round in two years. I mean, you would imagine this PBC showtime situation is not going to get him out any sooner. Just from the outside looking in, I mean, he's not getting any younger. Just the sort of thoughts on the current standing of his career. The Ruiz fight seems to have been a bit of a shambles as well. Yeah, this is a pro I felt like Wilder Ruiz should have happened. I felt it was a great fight. I mean, that was ordered, what, a year ago? Um, the, one of the problems in boxing is the expectations of fighters is just too much. So, when you don't have, I mean, PBC don't have broadcast dates at the moment, but regardless of that, like, you've got to be looking at Deontay Wilder and say, let's go to Alabama, right, where he fills out the stadium, and let's just do a fight. Let's get some momentum, get you knocking someone out. You need to fight physically for your career as well. And he would say, I'll do that, but I want, I don't know, pluck a number out, five or, five or six million. And you look at the numbers, and the number might be three. And he goes, I'm not fighting for three million. It's like, you've got to ha look at the bigger picture. Like AJ. You know, AJ made very little money to fight Robert Hellenius. He was going to make good money to fight Dillian White, and he had to make a decision. Even now, you know, we might look at an opponent that we talked about, and I might say, well, you can do that fight, but it's really not going to hit the numbers that you're used to. It's no problem. I want to fight. I think I'm going to improve. I think it's going to give me momentum, and I think it's going to prepare me for Wilder or for Fury. But those guys, like Ruiz, the same. Like Andy Ruiz should really be boxing three or four times a year. Take him to LA, maybe do a fight in Mexico. But is he going to fight for two or three million bucks? Here you go, two or three million bucks. Oh, waste my time having a training camp for that. Really, then it, should you be in the sport? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Are you in the sport for the right reasons? And that's what gives me a lot of comfort from AJ. That he loves, but he wants to fight. He's not going, oh, mate. I'll tell you what, give me a call if a big one comes up. I'm going on the yacht. He's going, I want to get back in the gym. I want to fight. Get me a date. Whereas the others are just like swanning around. It's mad. Just last thing, Eddie. Uh, black History Month this month. Now, if we sat here and read off some of the greatest black boxers of all time, we'd be here all afternoon. But just was interested to get your thoughts. Sort of, is there any sort of, be it in boxing, sport or in life in general, any sort of big black figures you've taken inspiration from, be it business or, you know, what have you? I think that when you look at boxing, I mean, you know, you go well back to the likes of Jack Johnson and, and you know, probably the most iconic, of course, Muhammad Ali, who stood for a lot more than just boxing. Um, but in sport, you know, I mean, I think, I don't know if it's a hero, but I think one of the most iconic figures is Usain Bolt. Just feel that that guy was just incredible, you know, where he came from. And I did my podcast recently with Zarnell Hughes, who is a... Yeah, for GB and just broke the records. And he trained in Jamaica with Usain Bolt and just said he was incredible, unbelievable. So, you know, in boxing, that there's been many important figures in that respect, not just in the ring, but you know, out of the ring as well and across promotion, management, production. Um, but certainly Jack Johnson and, and Muhammad Ali, two trailblazers. Ali, thanks for much for your time. Cheers.